Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Andrew Brankley and welcome to the Static 99R training video on offense clusters. You might be sitting there wondering why. Why do I have Nicolas Cage in the background of this movie? Well, dear listeners, it's because I recognize my limitations as a speaker. Only Mr. Cage, an actor who has starred in over 70 films in 30 years, talking at seemingly random volumes, can accurately convey the sheer mind-bending frustration of trying to sort out a mess of offense clusters. Stay till the end of this video and you'll see what happened to the research assistant who helped me collect materials on Mr. Cage. The core concept of this video is about being able to determine if someone continue to offend after being convicted and sanctioned for an offense. Persistent offending likely indicates serious or entrenched problems. Let's begin with the key elements of an offense cluster. First is the harmful sexual behavior itself. It may have been one event or several events over a period of time. Next is when they are formally detected by the criminal justice system. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Been drinking, have we? Just a nip. Going to arrest the man for that. Going to detain a blighter for enjoying his whiskey. It's all right, that's enough, sir. Beggars and mash. Sir? Balls and squeak. What? Smoke your pie. Sir? Haggers! That's it. Dismount the banister. The third element is the sanction or punishment they receive for the offense. And lastly is their release to the community. Opening that proverbial door and getting the sweet taste of freedom that is so important to many of our evaluators. Open it! Open it! To save space in this video, I'll mostly be using the symbols for the first two. Unless I say so, assume that if someone is formally detected, they were also sanctioned and then released. I like to use a table to organize a person's criminal history. It just makes me a bit happier when having to deal with some of the more challenging problems. Put the right foot in! You take your right foot out! You do the hook! Hook in! You Each row is a separate charge or conviction. Usually that's the same thing as the offense, but sometimes one offending event may have several charges and convictions associated with it. If so, I like to separate them into separate rows to make sure I am not making any errors in terms of the offense timeline. You can use the first column to provide useful headings. The remaining columns relate to time periods, any unit that is useful. The only rule is that if you place it within the same column, it occurred at the same time. Column T2 here represents a time period, day, week, year, whatever, that was before T3. And T4, a time period that was after T3. From there, T1 is before T2, and so on. You could say it's the before before. <laughs> Get it? Get it? Before before and after after? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. I'm not that funny. Here's an example using two made-up individuals, Alan and Bill. All things being equal, based upon Alan and Bill's offending pattern, the question I'm going to ask you is which person is higher risk? Both of them have two convictions for sexual assault, but let's examine the order of events. Alan committed one sexual assault in 2012. Bill committed both of his sexual assaults in 2012. Both were arrested in 2013, but Bill was only arrested for one of his sexual assaults. Alan and Bill then served their time and were released. In 2015, Alan committed his second sexual offense, leading to his arrest in 2016. Bill was also arrested in 2016, but for the previously undetected sexual assault in 2012. Now that we have caught up to the present, 
is Alan or Bill higher risk based upon their offense history? If you picked Alan, that would be right. Sorry if you picked Bill. I'm wrong again! Wrong about us! Think of Alan's first offense as a unit because it contains all four elements described previously. Behavior, identification, and implied sanction and release. While released, he chose to re-offend, so we have a second offending unit. Bill committed the same number of offenses, but it would be wrong to treat them as two separate units like Alan. Bill stopped defending in 2012. So when he was arrested in 2016, you can imagine how confused or frustrated he might have been. You know, I did everything I was supposed to do. I fought every rule in the book. In the end, they still Bill's offenses are treated as one unit or cluster. The number of offending units or clusters an individual has provides us information about their offense persistence and response to supervision. Think of drawing a horizontal red line from the beginning to end of the four elements in each row. Then try to draw a vertical blue line to separate the rows into units. If you can get a clean line, they are separate. If, however, the lines overlap, you have a cluster. Remember this and clusters will be as easy as singing the alphabet. You know. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z! Huh? That's all you have to do! There are three types of offense clusters that can occur. For each one, I will provide a definition and an example. The first cluster type is called multiple offenses. This is when you have multiple offenses that are dealt with in the legal system at the same time. For example, the person offends in 2012, then is arrested, charged, and released in 2013. They commit three separate sexual assaults in 2014. One is an ongoing issue that continues into 2015. They are arrested for these new offenses in 2016. The 2014-2015 offenses form a cluster separate from the 2012 offenses. This is because they are functionally separate in terms of understanding the individual's persistence and response. We consider charges to be pseudo-recidivism when a person is re-arrested but has not committed a new offense since their release. Imagine a situation like Bill's from before. One offense takes place in 2012 and another in 2013. The individual is only charged with one of the two offenses in 2014, is released in 2015, but is subsequently rearrested in 2016. The 2016 rearrest is pseudo recidivism, not true recidivism, because it was for the 2012 offense. The individual did not commit a new offense after his release. We would treat both offenses as being part of a single cluster, shown here in red brackets, because at no time during this period did the person choose to reoffend after being identified, sanctioned, and released by the criminal justice system. The third cluster deals with an unfortunate issue that can arise in the justice system, when a cluster of offenses that occur during the same period get seemingly spread out by their conviction or sentencing dates. Consider this. A person commits all four of their offenses during the same week time frame, week one. They are arrested during the following week for all four offenses. Nothing is missed. Later on, the judge convicts and sentences the individual only for the first two offenses. Imagine it was the end of the day on Friday and they just happened to run out of time. The judge finishes sentencing the individual for the third offense, 
but something gets in the way again, and they have to sentence the fourth offense during the week after. These four rows are part of one offense cluster, because at no time did the individual offend, get sanctioned and released, and then choose to reoffend. The third type of offense cluster could be easily missed if you are looking at a criminal history in a format like the one on the screen. One could easily just count the rows and come to the mistaken conclusion that the person has three separate offending periods or clusters. They don't. This might be frustrating, and I hope you aren't sitting there wondering how often you may have made this mistake. It's okay, it's not easy to tell if you don't have the details of the proceedings. A good check, however, is looking at the dates and the sentences. The person in this example was given an 18-month incarcerated sentence in the top row. It's not possible that he served that sentence, was released, reoffended, was identified, and then sentenced again within seven days. No matter how complex someone's criminal history may be, you can always reduce it down to these three cluster types. They are building blocks, not just for coding static 99R, but for a meaningful understanding of an individual's offense history. Thank you for watching this video. Please feel free to share it for training or teaching purposes. I truly am happy for you to use this video or slides themselves in your own presentations. I just ask that you leave the slide intact and reference it accordingly. Please contact me if you have any questions or comments. If you liked this video, then I hope you check out my other videos and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And now, as I promised, here is a short clip showing what happened to my poor research assistant. Dear God, okay. no, stand back. Give him space. Nicholas Cage, good or bad? A challenge, certainly, but not insolvable because all actors have distinct values, which I use to find answers. Abed, how much Nicholas Cage did you watch? Enough! I watched enough to find <laughs> the answers. <laughs> Because this, this is my reality. This is how I learned to be. And my being doesn't allow for Nicholas freaking Cage, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. 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 I'm a cat. I'm a sexy cat. Oh. Oh. That was brilliant.